Well, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a study I've entitled Worship and the Communion Service. If you're new, uh, what we're doing is we're working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. So we started in chapter 1, we're working our way through the book. Um, and in our bulletins, we've got a list of upcoming uh, studies, so I encourage you to read ahead. So you know what's coming down the road, so you can read ahead. And if you read chapter 12 next week, and then you come and you go, man, I've got some questions. Uh, you can write those down, see if I address them in the study. If I don't, please come up afterward and say, hey, I got this question. You didn't address it. I need the answer. This is bugging me. And I will do my best to help you um, find the answer for that question. Uh, but, well, we're going to be in chapter 11 here. And, again, uh, we're talking about the church in Corinth, and Corinth was in Greece. Now, if you're not um, a map person or, you know, geologically uh, don't really know where things are, uh, Greece is kind of right in between uh, Italy um, and uh, and over there uh, to the left of Turkey. So kind of right in the middle. It's on a peninsula. And uh, just a beautiful location there. Um, but one of the biggest problems in Corinth uh, for the church there was there was such disorder in the public meetings. And so we're going to be seeing that as we look at these next four chapters and the weeks ahead. Um, and some of the women that were in those churches were assuming more freedom than they should have. And so there was disorder at the Lord's Supper, what we would commonly call uh, communion or the communion service. Uh, there was confusion using the spiritual gifts. And so Paul is going to be dealing with that. Um, the church in Corinth was blessed with spiritual gifts. But sadly, they were lacking spiritual graces. They didn't know how to use those gifts for God's glory. Um, and so Paul patiently makes his arguments and corrects them based on God's word, gives them correction in the areas of public worship. And I love Paul's heart. You know, uh, as a father, um, I've got two options. I can beat my kids down and tell them they did such a terrible job, and it probably makes them not want to try again. Or I can say, you did a good job, here's a couple areas you need to correct, and, and let's do it again. And I think that's really Paul's heart here, is he could come and say, you guys are crazy. There's so, such chaos going on in the church. Don't even take communion right. You can't even fellowship together. You should just stop what you're doing. But he doesn't, because he knows that that's at the heart of the enemy, is to kill, steal, and destroy. And so Paul wants to encourage them. And so that's what he's doing in this chapter. It's encouragement to the church in Corinth. It's encouragement to us. Even though we could be, uh, you know, uh, causing some issues within the fellowship, uh, God's heart is, is that restoration. And, you know, so t sometimes we think uh, of so-and-so, and if you've got a family, there's always that crazy Uncle Harry. Um, but sometimes we're that person, and we need to understand uh, where we're at in the dynamic of, of the family within the fellowship. And so uh, Paul is going to be dealing with all of those, um, and that really becomes our outline this morning. I've got it up here on the screen for you. The first three ver verses we'll take a look at, uh, order, order in the church of God. Uh, verses 4 through 16 uh, really deal with women praying and prophesying. Uh, verses 17 through 22 deals with selfishness at the love feast, or what we would call potlucks. Uh, then verses 23 through 34 deals with the abuses at that communion service. So we'll look at that as we continue on our, our study here of 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, picking up in verse 1, uh, and we read what Paul says here. He says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. I'll pause there uh, before we kind of continue on. Immediately what Paul says here, he says, imitate me. And that word imitate, if you take a look at the Greek word, if you ever get a chance to get a concordance or a Greek lexicon, that's the fancy term for it, uh, you'll look at that word and you'll, you'll probably be able to understand what it means. The word there for imitate in the Greek is where we get our English word mimic. It looks very similar. And so that's what that word means. It means to mimic, to imitate, to follow. 
And so what Paul is saying, he's saying, imitate me, mimic my life, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Now, as I've been growing in the Lord and walking with the Lord, uh, I found, sadly, some are not willing to say what Paul said. Uh, sometimes because of compromise, uh, I think many are quick to say, hey, don't look at me, man. I don't have it all figured out. Look to Jesus. Which, in a sense, is true, uh, but we, because we ultimately need to look to Jesus. But I think every one of us should be able to be examples uh, to those around us and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, I don't know about your parents growing up. Um, my uh, stepfather in California, sometimes he would say, uh, Tim, uh, do as I say, not as I do. And I would scratch my head and think, what is he saying? He's, he's doing something, but he doesn't want me to do what he's doing. But he's telling me not to do what he's doing. But why is he doing what he's doing? And so it was so confusing as a kid trying to figure that out and think, if you don't want me to follow your example... Maybe you shouldn't be giving me that example to follow. <laughs> and so as Christians, we want to make sure uh, we're, we're being a good example. Um, we don't want to tell our kids, hey, uh, do what I say, not what I do. We want to be able to be an example to them. And that's scripturally uh, Paul's heart is he wants to be an example and encourages people to be an example. Uh, he encourages young Timothy, who uh, a, a younger pastor in 1 Timothy 4.12, he says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And then later, as Paul's uh, writing to the church in Ephesus, uh, in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So immediately Paul starts off uh, this section urging the, the Corinthians to follow him as he's following Jesus Christ. And really that should be our heart as well. As we should be able to, to turn to people and say, hey, follow me as I'm following Jesus Christ. I don't have it all figured out, but I know he's got it all figured out. Let's, let's follow him together. Um, and so if the Corinthian church can get that uh, direction, um, they're going to be heading the right way. And, and we want to be heading that direction as well as towards the Lord. Well, in verse 2, he praises them for remembering him in all things and keeping the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Which well, traditions? Uh, as we think about traditions, we probably first thing comes to mind is some family traditions or school traditions and those sort of things, which are harmless, you know. Um, the only time that we want to make sure we're not following traditions is the traditions of men that supersede the scripture. Uh, those we want to avoid. Uh, in Matthew chapter 15, um, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus to try and trick him and, and trap him and say, why do your disciples transgress the law? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Um, and, and Jesus said, why do, you, why do you break the law? You, you say that you're honoring your mother and your father, but you've come up with this term Corbin where you, you say, I've dedicated all my stuff to the Lord. I can't help mom and dad anymore. Um, and so God is always more concerned with the heart, the internal than the external. And so we never want to come up with a tradition that supersedes God's Word. Um, and so the traditions that are given in God's Word, they should be observed. Uh, we want to make sure we're following those. Now, Paul's going to be dealing with a tradition they had in Corinth. It wasn't given by God, but there were definitely some principles based on the Scripture. And so Paul's going to be showing that to them and applying that to those in Corinth. Uh, even though there's no other churches that had those traditions, it was just located uh, in that one area. And so it's, again, I think important that we know why we do and what we do it. I shared this a couple of weeks ago um, that I think it was about a year old in the Lord, maybe a couple years old in the Lord. And uh, we were praying before we were going to eat. And I thought to myself, why do we pray before we eat our food together? And I, I thought, I haven't read a verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt pray before thou eat, or it's a sin. And so I thought, why do we do that? Hmm. And so we ate, and then, and then I just kept thinking about it. And I thought, why, why do we do that? And so I searched the scriptures, and I looked, and I'm like, well, I ultimately want to follow Jesus. And I noticed every time Jesus had food, 
he gave thanks to the Father. He said, Father, we thank you for this food. He blessed it and then distributed it to those around him. I thought, that's it. That's why we do that. It's because we want to be thankful to the Lord for what we have, recognize our provision came from him, um, and then be able to enjoy it because our Father has loved us and blessed us. And ultimately, we want to follow the example of Jesus. He's given us a model to follow. So I thought, well, great. That's why we're doing what we do. Uh, And so any tradition, even if it's that simple, we want to make sure we know why we do it. We understand it. Otherwise, we can just go through the motions. And I, you know, I've been at at, at tables before, and and you don't pray before you eat, and everyone looks at you like, oh no, he just committed the unpardonable sin. You know, let's stop and pray real quick before God gets angry at us. Um, and so we want to understand um, why we're doing it, what we're doing it. Again, traditions aren't bad, only bad if they supersede the scriptures. Uh, then we want to avoid those. Um, well, and then in verse 3, Paul begins to really deal with the order in the church there. He says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. So here we have the chain of authority established. Um, And so if you've ever uh, thought this through, you know that the head is the one who's leading in charge and accountable. Um, You know, I've often heard it said that you know, our head is the, is the part on our body that's really our, our navigation. You know, our mind is telling us uh, and, and controlling everything in our body. And so, you know, there's nothing really in nature that has two heads that functions well. And so God knows that our bodies need one head um, and that spiritually in marriage there needs to be one leader. And within the church there needs to be one leader. And ultimately all of us need to be following the ultimate head of Jesus Christ and his leadership. Now, the Bible has never taught that God favors man over the woman. Um, However, it does teach that the man was first, uh, and then God took the rib uh, from Adam and made woman. Um, And I love what it says in Genesis. It says that, um, you know, after Adam had named the animals there in the Garden of Eden, um, there was no helper for him. And so God put him in a deep sleep and, and made woman. And brought woman to him. Um, and so, woman was, was created for Adam to complete him, to be a helper to him. Um, and I think God saw uh, man and he thought, you know, he's not going to be able to make it on his own. He needs some help. I, I need to bring someone alongside to help. And I love what it says in Proverbs. It says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And so I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, I am so thankful for my wife and for God's design. Uh, and so this chain of authority is God's design. And he knows what's best. Um, I know that there's many today that say, you know, we're old-fashioned. You, you really believe that marriage is just between one man and one woman? Well, that's what the Bible says. We didn't make it up. That's God's design. That's God's order. Because he knows what works best. And unfortunately, uh, we've been hearing stories from, from many people, um, email, social media, uh, who grew up in a home with two moms or two dads. You know, back in the 70s, they were trying all these different things. And, and they're sharing their stories now, how their life was miserable. They grew up not understanding their role and how to function. And um, they wished for that dad or they wished for that mom. And so God knows what's best. He's told us in his word. And he knows what's best both in the house, in the church of God, and in ministry. And so we have this established order that it's God, the husband, and then the wife. And then under that, if you have kids, the kids would be down at the bottom. And so we want to make sure that we're we're recognizing God's order at the home and in the church. Well, next, Paul will be talking about praying and prophesying and some of the disruptions that were going on there in the public service uh, in verses uh, 4 through 16. Um, And we'll take that uh, a section at a time. So let's read uh, verses 4 through 6. And he says here in verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is one 
and the same as if her head were shaved. For a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. We'll pause there for a moment. Now, in the context of what's going on in Corinth, uh, you have to re- remember, as we've been looking back um, in our introductory study, as I talked about the culture there in Corinth, um, there was a temple uh, dedicated to the false goddess Aphrodite, and there were over a thousand temple prostitutes there, and they believed it was their religious obligation uh, to engage in pleasure and sexual morality. And so the ladies there in that temple would have their heads uh, shaved or really short hair. And that was a sign of who they were, and they were identified by the men that they were able to go in there and have relations with these women. And so, and Paul, in knowing the context of this culture, um, the the women there in Corinth, they would wear a veil or a head covering. Uh, We might say it was a shawl kind of over their head to protect their purity. Uh, But it was also something else. It was also a sign of authority. If they were married, they were under the authority of their husband. If they were unmarried, they were under the authority of their father. And so it was very unique here in Corinth that they had this. Um, But what we do see today, uh, we we see that over in the Middle East cultures, that today many of the women still dress to cover themselves. Um, And and if you've ever seen any of the pictures or done any traveling in the Middle East, often you'll see them covered and then their garbs from head to toe. Um, And and it's it's a protection. It's an identity. It's an authority. Um, And so I always encourage uh, ladies and guys, if you're going to travel to the Middle East, especially go to a Muslim country, make sure you dress appropriately. Um, If you go to a Muslim country, ladies, you want to make sure you know what you're going to wear in that Muslim country because you don't want to give the wrong signal. Um, And so here uh, in uh, Corinth, um, they had to make sure that they were were wearing the proper stuff. Now today there's a group, I I found this as I was researching, uh, uh, based in Canada. And they're called the Head Covering Movement, which is interesting. It's founded by a man uh, who seeks for women to return to wearing head coverings. And yet they misunderstand the cultural uh, significance of what those head coverings represent. Uh, I think if somebody had a head covering here in America, I think most of us Americans wouldn't understand. Uh, We wouldn't say, ah, yes, that's a sign of purity, or oh, yes, that's a sign of authority. But when you go to these other countries, everyone knows They understand that. Um, And I think the closest thing maybe we have today, it's not exactly, but I mean, it's somewhat close, is maybe the wedding ring. Uh, That might be the closest thing that I could think of. You know, it's a sign. Hey, I'm taken. I belong to somebody else. Back off, you know. Um, And so Paul is dealing with these issues uh, here in Corinth. And he's talking about this head covering. And um, as we continue on, we'll see uh, he kind of develops this thought a little bit more. Uh, In verse 7, he says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. So again, there's an order that God has created. God, man, woman, children. Um, And so for the Jews... Um, they would pray to God with their heads covered. Uh, it was a sign of unholiness um, to approach Him without their head covered. And so the Jewish law required men to cover their heads with a kippah or a skull cap. It was a sign of reverence and respect for God. And so they would do that when they were praying or studying the Holy Scriptures, saying a blessing or entering a synagogue. Now what's interesting, if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, if you go to the Western Wall, to the Wailing Wall, uh, for guys, they actually have uh, caps there for you to put on. And they will not allow you to approach the Wailing Wall without your head covered. Now, we had been given some hats from our travel group that we had, but there were some who didn't have it. And so they freely provide it there for you uh, to put that on as you go and approach the, the Wailing Wall. And so uh, they believe it's a sign of reverence and respect. Um, Now, sadly, some churches have misused these verses in the other direction. They have wrongly forced men to remove their hats in church services. Uh, Maybe you've heard some of the stories where a gentleman is is in service and they're about to pray and... and, uh, you know, 
some people are moving their hats and somebody doesn't, an elder comes over and takes the hat off of him forcefully, and, and the guy's feeling like, what did I do? You know, I, I didn't know I was supposed to take my hat off. Um, and so sometimes they're used in the wrong context. Um, and so I think that's a personal choice. Uh, if a guy wants to keep his hat on, um, that's up to him. If he wants to take it off as a sign of reverence or respect for the Lord, that's up to him. Uh, but we shouldn't force someone to do that. Because God's looking at the heart. He's not looking at the external. Um, well, Paul's going to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff that the ladies were going through here in verses 8 through 12. And so he says, For man is not from woman, nor woman from man. Nor was man created for woman, but woman for the man. For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. So again, God created marriage. He's got his established authority. That's what Paul's building on. And he's talking about this head covering and, and the symbol in marriage. Um, and he's talking really about this, this idea of submission. And I know that's not a, a church word that everyone likes to hear. But if you take a look at that Greek word, it's hupotasso. And what that word means is to voluntarily rank yourself underneath someone else. It's a military term. So for those soldiers who go into the military, they don't go in and say, I'm the commander-in-chief. You listen to me now. No, they go in and they have to voluntarily rank themselves underneath the authority. And then over time, as they're trusted, then they can get promoted. Um, but they have to rank themselves underneath. Uh, if they don't, well, there's some trouble to pay as they try and do it their way. And so it's that same Greek word here is hupotasso. So what God is saying is that, that the ladies who are married, make, make sure I make that very clear, if you're not married, you're not to submit to any guy. Uh, if you're married, you're, you're to submit to your guy, to your husband. Um, and so that's the, the bounds of this, this submission, is within the context of marriage. Uh, and so the gals are to voluntarily rank themselves underneath their husband. Why? That's God's design. Uh, I think a lot of gals are probably more capable of running the household than the guy. Uh, but God has ordered it in that way, uh, that he wants the man to lead. Uh, but the man is supposed to voluntarily rank himself underneath the Lord. And so he's supposed to be following the Lord. And, I, and my wife will often remind me when there's something going on and we need to pray and make a big decision. She'll say, honey, um, I'm going to trust that the Lord is leading you. Because ultimately, uh, you're not accountable to me. You're going to be accountable to the Lord for this decision. I think, oh, I better pray again. I better make sure I'm really seeking the Lord. Um, and that's such great advice. Is that as guys, we're accountable we need to make sure that we're, we're letting the Lord lead us and we're guiding in the right direction. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're under His authority. Now, if somebody's in a relationship, uh, if they're married, uh, and the guy is not under the authority of the Lord, then I think the wife skips that and goes underneath the Lord. Um, God has not created marriage to be a place of subjection and abuse. Uh, he's created it to be a, a place of love and trust and intimacy. And so God wants marriage to be a place uh, of love um, and not, not a place where a man can force a woman to serve him. Um, and so there's a submission in marriage. Uh, and there's something other, other, another thing here that's interesting Paul mentions. Um, you almost wonder why he mentions it uh, here in, in verse 10. He says, you know, that for this reason, woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. And, you know, why did you have to bring up the angels? What, what is that whole point there? And there's a lot of debate on, on what that means. I think simply Paul is using that as an illustration. I think he's showing even the angels are in submission. Even the angels voluntarily rank themselves underneath the Lord. And we know that there were some who, who turned away from the Lord. That Satan uh, took a third of the angels with him. And they ranked themselves underneath Lucifer, the devil. Um, but God still has two-thirds, and plus God created the angels. He can always kick their butt. He can always win. And we have, we've read the end of the Bible. We know he already wins in the end. Um, 
And I love the scriptures because it shows that one angel came and wiped out a whole Assyrian army in one night. So one angel can do that. Uh, God's got more, and God's in control. Uh, and so there's this ranking in the, the realm of angels. Even these submit and voluntarily rank themselves underneath God. So there's this order that is, is God-given, and it should be in the home and in the church. Now, in verse 13, Paul says, Well, judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? I think the answer for there in Corinth would be no, because the ladies didn't want to identify themselves as, a, as a, one of the temple prostitutes. For them, it would be a shameful. Um, the husband would say, hey, when you go outside, make sure you cover your head. Don't let anyone get the wrong idea, because we're married. Uh, here in America, can a gal go around with her head uncovered? I think yes, because we don't have that same understanding. Um, now, if you're going to be dressing in a way that people would think that, then that's something completely different. So we want to make sure we're not giving off the wrong signals. We don't want people to think, this person says they're a Christian, but by the way they live or dress or act or the external things, that they're really saying, I'm a sinner and I'm in this lifestyle. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. Now, another thing we can kind of get from this verse is he's asking, is it proper for a woman to pray to God? Uh, but he's really talking about with her head uncovered. And in the scriptures, it teaches us that women often prayed and even prophesied. We'll see this in the weeks ahead. Um, and I am so grateful for Christianity. I mean, it has, has really uh, brought such a freedom and a liberty uh, to the human race. Every other culture, every other religion usually puts women in subjection. Uh, in fact, some of the cultures, it, it's a different order. It's the man, it's the boys, and then it's the wife and the dogs. And sometimes it's the dogs over the wife. Um, and so in Christianity, God has, has really uh, elevated women uh, to, to uh, I think, the rightful status is that she should be beside her husband. Um, and so God has, has really done a mighty work. And, and I'm grateful uh, that women pray. Uh, I know my wife prays for me, and, and I, I love that. Um, I'll confess there's times where I'm in the other room, and I hear my wife praying, and I hear her pray for me. I think, oh, Lord, I love her. I just find that so attractive to hear my wife praying for me and thinking, you know, Lord, bless him and use him and help him. Um, I think, yes, that's great. Um, I think we should be praying for our spouse. We should be praying for each other. Uh, we should be praying for the church. We should be praying for America. Uh, God wants us to pray. And he makes no limits on who can be praying and who can't pray. And so we want to make sure that we're people of prayer. Um, that we're praying to the ultimate one who's in authority. Well, in verse 14, he gives another example. He says, does not, does not even nature itself teach you that a man, if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, verse 14 was used often in the hippie days. Uh, that was a verse that I remember my pastor saying when he had long hair back in the day that people felt the nerve to quote it to him, say, look, the Bible says it is shameful for men to have long hair. Now, what's interesting here, it doesn't say how long is too long. It doesn't say to the shoulders or to the waist or, you know, at the ear level. There's no length. Uh, it, and, and so if it's long hair, it doesn't say it's sinful either. It just says it's a shame. Uh, that it, It's a dishonor. It's a shame. And so when I see guys and their hair is down to their waist and long, you know, I'm not going to say they're in sin, but I, internally I'm thinking, man, what a shame. And then I go and I look in the mirror and, and I see my hair is falling out and changing color. I say, what a shame. <laughs> so whether you got too much hair or not enough hair and it's, it's leaving you, uh, it's external. You know, it's going to come, it's going to go, it's going to change color. God's looking at the heart. He's looking at the internal. And now verse 15 says that a woman should have long hair. It, it, it's in a sense a covering for her. And I think long hair on a lady is a beautiful thing. Uh, but again, God is more concerned with the internal than the external. My advice for the gals would be this, is if you're married, ask your husband, hey, I'm thinking of getting my hair changed. Um, what would you like? Do you want my hair longer? Do you want it shorter? What can I do to please you? 
I think that's appropriate. In the bounds of marriage, we want to make sure we're pleasing our spouse. Gals, if your husband says, I don't care, you look beautiful, great. Then you've got permission to do what you want. Um, And so we want to make sure uh, that we're in that subjection in marriage. We're we're in submission. Uh, We're not going to overstep our bounds. Um, But we want to make sure we're pleasing our spouse. Again, it's the internal, not the external that God is 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 worried about and i think verse 16 is the key if you've got a pen or a pencil i highly encourage you underline this verse in your bible this is the key verse i believe to this whole section because many people want to take a verse here and there and and try and and apply something to you i think verse 16 is the summation uh, that we always need to remember and so he says but if anyone seems to be contentious we have no such custom nor do the churches of God. And so the other churches didn't have this custom. They didn't have this custom of the head covering. Um, again, because the Jews, that was, that was really odd for Paul to be saying this. As he grew up Jewish, uh, anytime he would approach the Lord in anything, he had to have his head covered. Yet he's telling those here in Corinth, the guys, you know, don't cover your head, gals. Make sure your head is covered. Um, so the other churches didn't have this custom. It was something uh, that was just going on here in Corinth. It was very unique. Uh, But he says if anyone seems to be contentious, um, you know, that we don't have this custom, you know, nor do the other churches. It's a reminder to me that we never want something secondary, such as covering your head or not, become more important than the primary. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether you cover your head or not is not going to save anyone. Whether you share the gospel of Jesus, that he loves you, died on that cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, that's what's primary. That's what's going to change hearts and transform hearts. And so often people are trying to change the external, change the outward. Uh, They want to reprogram you. What God wants to do is work from the inside out. He wants to change your heart, give you a new heart with new desires, and transform you from the inside out. Uh, And that's what God is concerned about. So, you know... Many people will try and take these verses and use them to tell men you got to take your hat off or you can't have your hair a little bit long. Um, you know, or gals, you always have to have your head covered. Uh, again, we don't want to be contentious. Um, you know, if you can live with a clear conscience um, and it's not of sin uh, for your head to be covered, then do it. And if you're in that culture, if you're visiting a, a culture that um, that's just kind of the norm there, that you know you don't want to get off the wrong signals, that you're promiscuous or something like that, then you want to make sure that you're you're um, not giving off any wrong signs. But uh, we never want to do something secondary to the gospel that distracts the church or divides the church. And that's really Paul's heart here uh, in this section. Well, next Paul is going to deal with the selfishness at the love feast. Uh, the selfishness that was going on there at their, their gatherings. And that's in verse uh, 17 uh, through 22. So we'll pick up here in verse 17, and Paul continues, Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. For there must also be fractions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore... When you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. I'll pause there. So a lot going on here. Uh, And Paul is dealing with some of the issues that they were having there in Corinth. From the very beginning, as the church was established in the book of Acts, uh, the Christians got together in fellowship. Uh, They broke bread. They they connected. They had this oneness. And and that word there is, is koinonia. It's a, it's a fellowship, it's a oneness. It's also where we'll look at this later, the word uh, communion comes from. Um, and so they had this togetherness. 
And it was an opportunity for fellowship and for sharing. In the Bible, uh, we've seen this term agape feast. Uh, the Greek word for agape it, it means love in the English language, so they'd also call it the love feast. If you read in Jude and some of the later uh, epistles or letters, you'll see the word love feast. Uh, and so that's what they're talking about. Uh, its main emphasis was showing love for the saints by sharing with one another. Now, today we don't really have that term. Um, the closest thing that we would have is what we call our church potlucks. It's a time for us to come together and to share our food with each other um, and to really uh, fellowship with each other. But there was some serious trouble going on here in Corinth. Um, they were abusing it, and as a result, these love feasts were doing more harm than good to the church. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was going on there was they had these cliques. Uh, that people would come in and uh, they would associate with those they knew but wouldn't want to talk to that new person. You know, that, that person would come and they just feel, well, nobody's even said hi to me. I'm out of here. You know, uh, this is what Christians are supposed to be like. I don't feel very loved at all. I'm going to leave. And so we never want to give that an impression um, that we're just, uh, you know, about this group. Uh, we always want to make sure we're looking to reach those and bring them with us uh, to have them join us. Now, another issue they were having um, was that people were, were coming and being selfish. Uh, the rich people were bringing a great deal of food, but it was only for themselves. Uh, those poor members of the church went away hungry. And Paul said that that's not good. Um, you know, so that would be like you come into the Pollock and bringing all this food and then putting it all on your plates and your spouse's plate and your kid's plate and not leaving any for anyone else. Uh, it, it's a time of sharing. And so uh, the stuff that was going on there wasn't good. It was doing more harm than good to the church. And so the whole idea of the agape feast of sharing had been lost. They lost the idea of, of loving on each other and encouraging each other. And so there was all this division going on. And, uh, and so Paul said that it wasn't good. Uh, he didn't praise them in, the, in that because they, they were doing something that was shameful. Uh, they were doing something that they, uh, they were taking advantage of their brothers and sisters. So we, we just uh, celebrated communion last week. This next week we'll celebrate uh, in our fellowship together and have our potluck. Um, and so I, I think it's interesting that in the context of this uh, study is kind of right between the two weeks um, as we're looking um, to, to fellowship together. And so next Paul's going to deal with communion. And that can be a subject that uh, people get confused on. So uh, we'll take a look at that and spend the remainder of our time looking at the communion service and what was going on in Corinth and how they were really abusing that. Um, here in verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take Eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. A pause there before we continue on. And so, here in verse 23, Paul says, I, I receive from the Lord, and that I'm also delivering it to you. And I think that's a great reminder and a great example for us, is that before we pass on something to someone else, it should first affect us and change us. Um, you know, I've heard it said before that our family would rather see a sermon than hear one. Uh, you know, if somebody says, hey, I've got this book for you, uh, I think it's going to be a great resource, usually my question is, have you read it? What did you think of it? Well, I haven't got around to reading it, I just thought you might enjoy it. Well, why don't you read it first, let me know what you think, and if it's really that good, then, then I'll read it if you recommend it. And, and so, uh, that's the way it should really be. I mean, if you see a Christian movie, um, you know, like the recent one that came out, War Room, which is a great one, if you get the chance, go see War Room, um, you know... If it's really that good um, and it comes out on DVD, buy it. The gift of someone say, hey, this is a great resource. 
I, I think you're going to enjoy it so much, I bought it for you. I've seen it. Here you go. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're allowing God's Word to first change us. And then it will tell others about the Word of God. And that's really my, my goal as I teach God's Word. I never want to come to the Scriptures and try and share something without first letting it affect me. Um, so every time I'm studying, preparing uh, to, to, to teach God's Word, uh, I first ask, Lord, change my heart, transform my heart, speak to me. And then once you've done that, then speak through me. So I can, can communicate your word uh, in a way that makes sense. And not try and, and preach something that I'm not practicing myself. And so Paul's saying he's received something from the Lord and he's sharing it. And he says on the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took this bread. He gave thanks and broke it. And said, take this, uh, eat this. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So the night before Jesus went to the cross was the same night that he was betrayed by Judas. And there at the Lord's Supper, as they're celebrating Passover, Jesus takes the Passover bread, gives thanks, breaks it, and then gives it to his disciples to eat. Now, Passover was something that was established in the Old Testament. Uh, when the Israel, Israelites were in Egypt under the bondage of Pharaoh, God gave ten judgments or ten plagues um, to the people there in Egypt, to, to let his people go. And the last one was a death of the firstborn. And God made a provision to take the blood of a lamb and apply that blood to the doorpost of their house. And if they did that, the angel of death would pass over their home. And that's where the term Passover came. And so it's a, it's a, a symbolism spiritually that points us to the Messiah. That as Jesus was on that cross, as his blood was applied to that wood, to that, that post, uh, to those beams of the wood, that the angel of death would pass over that blood. Now we know Jesus was in the tomb three days, then he rose from the grave. But for us as Christians, our body will physically die, but spiritually we'll live on. Because the blood of Jesus has been applied to our hearts. So we die, the angels will look uh, and see that and say, well, I'm going to take you to the presence of the Lord. Death is going to pass over you because of your trust in Christ, that the blood of the Lamb has been applied to the door of your heart. So we're trusting in Jesus as the Messiah. And the point of communion bread is that reminder that Jesus' body was bruised and broken and beaten. That it, it was, it was uh, beaten and scourged. It was... His uh, chastisement upon him brings us our peace, that by his stripes we are healed. And so it's a tangible reminder of the gospel message of what Christ has done for us. And it's interesting, it says here in verse 25, that in the same manner after supper, Jesus did the same thing. He took the cup, gave thanks, then gave it to his disciples to drink. And he said, this is the sign of the new covenant. So what was the old covenant? What is the new covenant? I think oftentimes Christians don't realize, but they're trying to live the Christian life under the old covenants. The old covenant was between God and his people. Right? There were blessings for obedience. There were curses for disobedience. You know, if you, if you weren't following the Lord and you were off worshiping an idol, well, either you got chastised or judgment fell upon you. Um, and I think a lot of times Christians are trying to, to, to live that way. And we can't. Uh, and so God established a new covenant. God doesn't change. He just changed the contract so more of us could get in. And I'm thankful for that. So the new covenant is between the people of God and God. It's between God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ. So how do we get in on this new covenant? Well, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. Uh, we abide in Christ, and then we're abiding in that covenant of grace. So Jesus came to establish a better covenant, and we read that in the book of Hebrews. He came to bring about a new way for us uh, to have fellowship with Him without trying to, to, to live up to the rules and regulations of the Old Testament. So this new covenant is a better covenant. It's a covenant of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And that's really this idea of communion, that this, this blood... Uh, you know, this juice in this cup is, is representative of his blood on the cross for us. So, in verse 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So, communion, 
How often are we to take communion? Uh, I was asked that question actually just last week and uh, as we had communion together. And I thought, that's a great question. Uh, what do you think? Because the Bible doesn't tell us. You know, it doesn't say you need to have communion every week, or every month, once a year. Um, but it says that it should be done regularly. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So we want to be partaking of communion uh, regularly. And it's for everyone who wants to remember what the Lord has done on the cross for us. Um, so how often we partake communion? Uh, as a church, we take it the first Sunday of the month. Um, that's something that uh, I've learned from my pastor. seems to work well. Uh, again, it's, it's a church tradition, but we don't find any tradition in the scriptures that tell us how often. Um, sadly, there are some churches that don't take communion at all. Uh, they don't do communion or baptism. Uh, because they, they don't uh, believe that it should really be done today. And that's very sad because the scriptures clearly teach that we are to be partaking of communion and baptism as well. Uh, that's a one-time deal. Um, communion is, is something that should be done regularly. And so we want to make sure that we're following what the scriptures teach us. Um, now, some people think that communion removes their sin or absolves their sin. Uh, somehow it makes them more holy. And that's not the case either. The scriptures tell us it's to be done in remembrance of. It doesn't say take communion to wash away your sins. No, that's been done at the cross. Jesus already did that for us. It's to remember what he's done for us at the cross. Um, so communion is an a outward action because of that inward change of reality. And, uh, you know, another question that's come is, well, what age uh, should someone take communion? Do you have to go through a confirmation class? Do you have to uh, be a member? Do you, you know, is there a certain age? What's the restriction on taking communion? Again, we don't find that in the scripture. There's nothing in there that says you have to be this age or this spiritually mature to take communion. Uh, and so, Anna and I, we were at a, a pastor's leaders conference a few years back. Um, and, uh, gosh, probably about five years ago. It was right before we had Josh. And um, we heard this uh, pastor, one of the pastors was sharing uh, with the rest of, uh, and he said, um, you know, he grew up in a denomination uh, that wouldn't allow kids to partake of communion. And as a kid, he always thought, why? I love Jesus. I want to remember for myself what he's done for me. And he said he, he grew up very discouraged in that denomination and, and would always just wonder why he wasn't able to partake of it. And so he was encouraging us to think through that uh, process and, and reminded us the scripture that Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me. Do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And so... Um, as communion, as a church, uh, we leave that up to the discretion of the parents. Uh, to If they want to allow their kids to partake of communion, that's up to the parents. If they don't, that's up to the parents. Uh, but for my wife and I, we allow our kids to partake of communion. Uh, I want my kids to know what Jesus did for them. Uh, I don't think it's a salvation issue that if you take communion, um, that you're going to somehow be disconnected from the Lord or he's going to be upset with you. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it's to be done to remember. Now, as my kids get older, if they ask, well, why are we taking communion? Great. Then why don't you stop and think it through? Uh, because now you're at the point of accountability where you're, you're trying to understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so communion is a time of remembrance of what the Lord has done. And anyone can partake of communion. But it's also interesting here. He says that um, as we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So it's a reminder that, as we're partaking of communion, it's a tangible reminder of the gospel message. And we'll continue to do that until the Lord returns and take us home to be with Him. Well, verse 27 and onward, he says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That's another word for saying death. 
Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest ye come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Well, verses 27 through 29 have often confused many theologians and churches. What in the world does it mean to partake of communion in an unworthy manner? And I can tell you, as I was growing up, that verse was so often used to say, Hey, look, we're going to take communion in a second. Scripture says, don't take in an unworthy manner. Otherwise, judgment could come upon you and you can get sick or die. So make sure you're worthy before you partake of communion. And I would often think, I am so unworthy. I'm not going to partake communion. And oftentimes, I wouldn't. I, I would just pass because I think, I'm so unworthy. Who am I? I? I've sinned. I'm not worthy to partake of communion. And as I've come to Christ and matured, I realize, I'm still not worthy. <laughs> I, I still sin. And, and, but as, as I've learned and studied, I've realized my worth, my worthiness does not depend upon my works and my merit. Because Christ said, Tim, you're worth it for me to die on that cross for you. That's where my worth comes from, is what Christ has done for me. That he loved me so much that he took my place on that cross. So our worth comes from Jesus Christ. It's the grace of Jesus Christ. So the context here then of the word worth is on how they were partaking of communion. Not that they were, but on how they were doing it. Some of them were getting drunk. Some of them were gorging themselves. Uh, on this, this supper, on this communion time. And so in verse 30, Paul says that either some of the Christians were sick and dying because of how they took communion improperly, or another option is that because they hadn't appropriated the healing that Christ had for them. In either case, they received a corrective judgment that God brought on them for really misrepresenting the Lord to the other Christians. And so we don't ever want to discourage someone from partaking of communion. Uh, we do want people to examine and make sure that they're not uh, living a lifestyle of sin. They're not going to partake of communion as a willy-nilly kind of thing to, to make mom or dad happy. Uh, we want them to truly understand why they're taking it. And to remember what Christ has done for them. And sometimes people will partake of communion and in that moment realize what Christ has done for them and receive Jesus Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. I think that would, would make the Lord very happy to know uh, that if someone's partaking of communion, they're giving their life to Jesus Christ. So we want to make sure on how we're doing stuff, that we're doing things as the Lord has told us. That we would have a heart to love Jesus and to love others. So in closing... Uh, may we follow God's order in the church and at home. May we not misrepresent Jesus to our culture. And may we continue to partake of communion. And I want to throw this out there. Um, again, there's nothing in Scripture that says you can't take communion at home. And so the church is modeled after the home, uh, not the other way around. So I want to encourage you to take communion at home. How regularly? I'll leave that up to you. Uh, but as a husband and a wife, uh, I would encourage you to take communion together. If you've got kids, uh, you know, that's up to you. But I would encourage you to let them be a part of that. It's a great time to remember our family is built on Jesus Christ. Our marriage is built on Jesus Christ. And, and as a church, our church, this church here is His church. It's built on Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you have given us your word, a more sure word uh, than anything else out there. We thank you that you've given us uh, your directions, Lord, your instructions of blessing, that there is an order that you've given us to operate in. And Lord, we know outside of those bounds, outside of that order, there's chaos, there's confusion, there's heartbreak. But within that, Lord, there's beauty. Uh, there's trust, and there's growth, and there's fruit. So we pray, Lord, that we would be uh, walking within the bounds of your order, that we wouldn't uh, hit that guardrail and go off the road, but we'd stay on that road. We would stay on that straight and narrow path following you, Jesus. And Father, I pray that you'd help each of us here not to misrepresent you, that, Lord, if we do, we'd get right back uh, in fellowship with you. For your word says that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sins to you and, and ask for forgiveness.
So, Father, I pray that you'd help us to, to not follow the ways of the culture, to not follow the traditions of man uh, that supersede your word, but that our hearts and our families and our lives would back up the truth that as for me and my house, we're going to follow you, that we're going to serve you no matter what the culture around us says, uh, that our lives are going to look different. Because you've changed us to be different. You've transformed us. And Father, we pray that if there be any here this morning among us who have yet to surrender their life to you, they haven't said yes to you, they haven't opened the door of their heart to allow the blood of the Lamb to cleanse them of all unrighteousness, to forgive them of every sin, that they'd be doing that this morning, that they could have that blood on the door of their heart so they know that when they die, they'll pass from this life And be there with you in your presence, Jesus. Because the angel of death will pass over, seeing that blood applied to their heart. As every Christian here is praying and every head is bowed, if you're here this morning and have yet to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you know things aren't right between you, you and God, and you want to get things right, I just want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's not, it's not anything here at, at Calvary Chapel that saves you. It's simply Jesus Christ who saves you, and you turning to Him and trusting in Him. So if that's you, I would just want to encourage you to, to say this prayer in your heart and mean it. God, I realize that I am a sinner And I understand that my sin has separated me from you. And I want to be with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I ask that you would forgive me of every sin, of everything I've ever done wrong. I believe that Jesus came to this earth and died on that cross for my sin, for all the stuff that I've done. And that he was buried and rose the third day. And I believe that He wants to give me life. And so I ask Jesus that You'd come into my heart. That You would make me a new person. That You would cleanse me and change me and transform me. Help me to live a life that pleases You. I thank You so much for dying for me. For being my Savior and for being my Lord. I give You control of my life. Help me to to walk with you. Help me to be led by you. And I pray that as I grow these next few days, weeks, and months, that I would also learn that you want to be my friend. And I thank you so much for loving me. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If that's you this morning and you prayed to receive Jesus Christ for the first time or a rededication, I want to encourage you to either let the person to the left or right of you know or come let me know. Uh, But let somebody know that you made the decision to accept Jesus Christ because there's no greater decision you can ever make than to surrender your life to the God who loves you and made you and wants that relationship with you.